being patient with the, thank you for the patience for being, um, for dealing with the wrong link and being persistent and getting on and waiting around, really appreciate it. This meeting's being recorded, yay! Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, star of the show. <clears throat> If you would don't want to be recorded, you could just put yourself on, take, just take the camera shot off if everybody's option off. And then you could just mute yourself if you don't want to participate. That's totally fine. Just wanted to get you up to date with that. And let's see. So we the meeting is scheduled to go to uh, about 7.30. If we do go over a little longer, if something comes up, feel free to check out and, and whoever wants to stay on, that's fine. There's a chat option. If you're not familiar with the chat, it is, if you look down below, you'll see a little bubble that says chat and you can just type in the message to, you have options, you can click on everyone or you can have a private message. You can just click on the menu uh, in the chat and you can make that choice. My, I will be fielding the, the chat messages. So if you have any questions along the way, please feel free. Uh, questions, thoughts, comments, put them in the chat, or if you prefer, you can unmute yourself and, and just uh, do it that way. We, we want to make it as engaging as possible. So we're going to start with just some updates from the refuge staff and then from the friends. And then lucky for us, we have Kelly Jacobs. She's going to be giving a presentation on community science projects. Did I say the title right? I did. Uh, I'm A plus for me today. Doing all right. And so thank you, Kelly, for joining us and putting together presentations. I think it's gonna be really great. And then we'll have some time for questions afterwards and just kind of just chit chat and hang out with each other. It's been a long time, but I do have some good news. So we'll, we'll roll into that. Uh, before I get started, does anybody have any questions on how to use the Zoom features or just any questions up front that they need to, that burning questions they like answered? All good. Okay. Well, let me know if you go along if you're having any problems. Uh, Mark, it, Mark Lyle is on our friends board and he has just been just wonderful in hosting these programs for us. He takes the time out. So thank you, Mark, for hosting. And uh, Sharon Tinker is also one of the friends members. Uh, she's also a friends board member. And Sharon, thank you for joining us. And of course, all the volunteers. So some updates, really, 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 really good news is that we're gonna to start to open three days a week. It's gonna be partial at first, and it's gonna be on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 to two. And I just drafted an email today to send out to the volunteers to see if they are available on those dates. As time goes on, and as we see how the situation, the COVID situation goes, we will then uh, reassess and then hopefully reopen fully. But we're starting small. We wanna just, we're gonna have 50 people in the visitor center at the time. We're taking precautions to make sure that it is safe. We have tables around the perimeter of the desk so that there's a six foot distance between the person that's at the desk and, and uh, the visitors. And we're gonna uh, do uh, some other things to, of course, uh, san hand sanitizer, uh, stations. We're going to cordon off certain uh, exhibits that are really hands-on. So we're going to, we have a plan in progress to, to make it as safe as possible. So does anybody have any questions about that? Gail, yes. <laughs> you, people touch everything in the store. I personally am not the least bit worried about contracting COVID by something someone touched since science has said that isn't how you get it. Mm -hmm. um, so I assume we're just not gonna worry about that part, right? You know, it's one of those things, it's like when you go to a supermarket or yeah. any place else, it's just, it's the reality of it all. We are gonna limit the number of people in the store at one time, I think it's to five, I'll have to look back at the notes. Uh, but it's one of those, so it's a tough it's a tough situation, but it, to me it's it's like going into a, a grocery store. You're still you're touching everything. I just make sure wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. And it sounds like it's not really that tra that it's transferable from touching. It's more you know person to person contact, as right. you mentioned. But very good question. 
So I think that's something the friends are going to have to think about. Um, and the refuge staff have to kind of think about what, how do we mitigate that? Mm -hmm. And how do we cordon off some of the, the exhibits and those high, high touch areas? Like in the bison room, for instance, we'll take all those skulls and things in, that are hands on, we'll just take those out. Anything that's really going to draw people, the drawing table, the, the puppet theater, all those things are not going to be available. So, but very good question, Gail. Anybody else have any questions? Or Gail, did you want to add anything to that? Of course, I have another. <laughs> you, this is, and this is exactly what this is for. It's it's for having real discussions and 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 uh, questions and comments. So please. And you may address this in your email, um, but like at the arboretum, we've got a sign that says. You don't need to wear a mask unless you're not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And then you just trust that people are right. going to do the right thing. Right. And, and kind of at the visitor center at that desk, we are still kind of sitting ducks. I'm not too worried because I am vaccinated, but I didn't know if what I, I wouldn't want to volunteer if I'm going to have to wear a mask, actually. So I wondered what? Yeah, very good question. Very good question. So the policy right now is that if you're vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask. If you're unvaccinated, you are um, asked to wear a mask and social distance. And it's on an honor system. We are not allowed to ask visitors or each other if you're vaccinated or not. You, if you're willing to share that information, I'm vaccinated. So that gives me a lot more confidence. But I don't it's not required that you share that information with anybody and we can't ask other, other people. So we are gonna have signs up stating that information as well. So it's, it's, it's really tough. So that's why we're, we're starting out small and see how everything works, assess everything. And then if things are working okay, then we'll move forward. And the other thing is we wanna, we wanna open, we wanna be available for the for the visitors, but we also need to protect our volunteers and our staff as well. And our, our agency has been, especially the region three, Midwest region or Great Lakes region now, has been this, the uh, upper management has just been so cognizant of our staff and not only our staff, but the bigger picture of looking at people with families and elderly uh, members of the family that they're caring for. So they recognize it's not just about the, the staff member going back to work, but how do you care for all those other factors that you, you're dealing with in family life? So we've been fortunate that way. And I'm, I'm glad that they've been slow to open up to take care, but it is difficult because uh, visitors are wanting and they're calling now, you know, why aren't you open yet? And mm -hmm. so that's why we're attempting to at, do it in small steps. And we hope volunteers, if they feel safe enough, uh, will come back and join us. Um, I think we need to have a training and, and just discuss that. So I'm gonna send out an email tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking at the doggy, so cute. Uh, send out an email tomorrow, see who's interested, and then maybe we can do a virtual training and discussion, those people that are interested. And maybe I can pick your brain, Gail, of what you're doing at the Arboretum. Any anybody else questions or comments or input on that? Nancy, have you guys decided if that will be morning hours or afternoon hours, or is it still being debated? It's going to be ten to two. That was the we, right in the to, middle. Yeah, ten to two because Perfect. we're trying to say, well, we want to be because we still have some groups coming in, and so we want to be available because most groups come in the the morning, but we also have people that come in the afternoon. So it's kind of a, the best scenario, I think. We're gonna try it anyway. And the groups are limited to 30. And so, you know, we'll see how it goes. Anybody else? Yes, Audrey. Hi, so in regards to the mask, knowing that children currently cannot be vaccinated, um, are we moving in a direction of requiring children to wear masks? We can't require anybody to wear masks. We can just, uh, we can ask, we can't require. So it's, it's and that's why it's a, it's a difficult situation. I fully understand if volunteers don't wanna be in that front line because nobody wants to get this nasty disease and I fully understand and respect that. 
but we have to follow the, the guidelines and those that is that we cannot require. You can ask. So anybody else? Did you guys say that you have plexiglass up? For we only have plexiglass about? up. It's not at the front desk. We do have tables that are that uh, that are in front of the desk so that it creates at least a six foot length. Now, so, I mean, you don't, the only thing, if you're interacting with the visitors, you'll have that long space. You don't have to touch anything. You'll, they, they'll have the map. So you can just point and give directions. Now, however, going back to the store, that's a whole different story because then you're exchanging money, credit cards and working with merchandise. So that's something that we really need to talk about the friends and the, and the refuge staff to, to figure out how to, to manage that safely. So I think with the volunteers at the desk, it's gonna be really hands off. It's just, hey, this is, this is information, there's a map and we're gonna limit the number of people in at a time. And if you have suggestions on how we can manage this better, uh, please share from your experiences at, at other volunteer uh, places or at work or whatever, please feel free to share. You can send me an email. Any other questions? Really good questions, thank you. All right, well, if you have them, we will have a question and answer at the, at the end of the, the presentation today. Additionally, always you always can contact me by, by phone or my cell phone or by email. And Scott killed you too, the refuge manager, don't hesitate. We're, we're here to help and, and provide as much information as possible. Another good thing is they just, I don't know if you know about the Urban Refuge Initiative, it's an urban wildlife conservation program, and it cr was created about 10 years ago, and it's about, they designated money for connecting to urban audiences, so they, they allocated, uh, I think it's a million dollars a year for certain refuges to get, to make outreach programs with the urban areas, and there's only uh, 101 designated urban refuges in the country were actually one of them. And the parameters for that are that you have to be a refuge that's in, within 25 miles of a population of 250,000. So we're 20 miles away from Des Moines and we have a population of 250,000 or more. So we are considered one of those 101 urban refuges. Now there's priority refuges that are already received funding such as Minnesota Valley up in Minnesota or John Hines Refuge in Philadelphia, and they've been working on this for a number of years now. So now what they have done, they just opened up a whole new proposal period where other refuges can apply for getting that million dollars a year. So we just put in the proposal yesterday. So our staff has been really working hard. We only had a few days to get it in. And so that would be a really great thing for us. If we get that, we get an additional million dollars a year. And that means we could hire outreach uh, coordinators, uh, outreach biologists, uh, some really good things will happen. So, and that would tack on, we're working with the Greater Des Moines Urban Wildlife Conservation Partnership, which is a partnership between us, uh, Des Moines Park and Rec, Iowa DNR, Army Corps of Engineers and Polk County Conservation to work in the urban area together. And if we did get that million dollars, we can hire a coordinator to help with that. And the idea behind this is that the majority of the population in the country is 80%, is, is approximately 80% living in urban areas and they're more diverse areas and with different uh, cultural and ethnicity. And, those people don't visit refuges and we want to make sure that we are inclusive. The most, a most majority of people are usually middle-class, upper middle-class and they're usually um, uh, not of minorities. So we're trying to reach out to those urban areas so that we can get, reflect, our audience will reflect what the United States is made of. Not that we're not gonna deal with uh, our regular customers or rural areas, but it's just a way to get into that community to help them embrace their natural areas where they live and then hopefully expand out. So that's the idea behind that. So we're excited, we hope, we hope to get that. That would really add a, a really 
uh, new approach to the way we work with things, just having extra staff would just be amazing. Because we've been doing urban outreach with the people for pollinators, going to the farmers markets, uh, special events. It's just that it, we don't, we have to stretch ourselves. And a lot of you have participated in a lot of those outreach events. So, so we're excited. We'll, we'll keep you in, in touch and see how that goes as a process. They, this is the initial proposal and it goes through a selection committee. So I'm not sure when we'll find out if we get that, that funding or not. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so I'll just go into visitor services stuff and then I'll turn it over to Karen. So visitor services, uh, we've been working on revising signs and trying to get some work done on some of the exhibits and, and the visitor center. Uh, what else? Um, working on this proposal and I can't remember what else I was doing, but it seems like I'm, I'm still, and, and trying to get the, the visitor center reopened. So, and we've been do, doing a few uh, volunteer projects. We did some uh, seed cleaning a day and some planting days. So we hope to continue to expand those as, as we start to reopen. So any, any questions at all? So I got a question. Does all of the million dollars a year go to the refuge if your proposal is accepted? I believe so, yes. So we get a, a base budget each year that this will be an additional million dollars on top of that. So that would be dedicated for the urban. Or the urban. Right, so Karen, I think I'll turn it over to you. If anybody gets any, thinks of any other questions or comments, feel free to pop them in the chat or unmute yourself and we'd love to hear them. All right, well, um, I guess I missed the last couple meetings, but we do have a, two interns in the biology program now. So Anna and Isaac started at the beginning of June and so it's nice to nice to have them around. And we've been well; they have been doing doing some work um, with seed collection, some invasive species removal, some um, seed cleaning. Trying to catch up on those things. Um, what am I missing, Kelly? We'll think, Kelly. <laughs> oh, monitoring. So yeah. Um, doing some monarch monitoring. Um, so anyway, it's it's a little smaller crew than we usually have, but it's still better than nothing. So <laughs> we're happy to have them. Um, and then the big excitement we've had is, we, uh, I don't know if, you, if everybody's aware of the Regal Fridlary butterfly. It was reintroduced to Neil Smith in 2001 and it's a prairie dependent butterfly. And it's now being considered for a listing under the Endangered Species Act. So they're trying to gather information um, in the review uh, of the species to determine whether it should be listed. And one of the things that they wanted to do was get some uh, genetic samples from various places throughout its range. So it's, it's got a pretty wide range um, across the Eastern states. Um, and so we got, uh, we were asked to collect samples at Neil Smith. And at first I said, no, I don't think we had, cause they wanted at least 30 butterflies uh, to get uh, samples from. And I said, I don't know if we have that many. We usually only see one or two a year. Well, we, went out last Friday and caught 18. And then today we caught 14. So we got 32 wow. butterflies. And that's just in one area. So we have a lot more of them out there than I realized. So it's pretty exciting. Um, they, there seems to be a pretty good population of them around this year. So, so yeah, we're contributing to that effort. Um, that's really, we have 14 bison calves um, and they seem to be in pretty good shape this year with all the, all the well, more rain than we've had the last couple of years anyway. Um, so that's 
that's about all the news, unless somebody has any questions for me. I have a question, Karen. Yeah. Something I thought about um, that you had mentioned, I don't remember, it must not have been last year because nothing happened last year. So the year before, there were studying that monarchs, if you raise them in captivity, potentially that messes with their migration. Was that ever determined? Well, I think that study was completed and they, they said it definitely does have some effect on their ability to migrate. Um, and, you know, and it, the, the idea isn't necessarily that it's wrong if you wanna raise a few in captivity, but there are places where they're raising like hundreds or thousands of these of monarchs and then letting them go. And um, that might not be the best way to help monarchs. <laughs> Um, so, you know, if you do it on your own, um, I don't think you should feel guilty about it. And, and uh, I think the study showed it was mostly in the fall, like the last generation, right. um, that, that the generation that would migrate, that it was really right. um, messing with, but. Interesting, okay. Good question. Any other questions for Karen? Amanda had one um, asking about regals. Are they the ones that hang out on the gravel roads? And then she said, maybe not because <laughs> the ones she's thinking of are very abundant. So maybe Karen, do you think you know which one she's thinking about? I'm um, not sure is that, um, what would it be this? Have you been seeing them this year? or just other years. Cause we've had, there's sometimes there's painted ladies and uh, red admirals that are, can be pretty abundant. Yeah, it looks like these ones you're talking about have some blue on them. These ones have similar coloration, but they don't have the blue and they just all end up in the, the grill of our car. No, no. They hang out on the <laughs> gravel roads, like everywhere in Iowa. Yeah. Painted lady, you said, that might be it. Um, yeah, sometimes painted ladies have these big um, populations. Um, yeah, so there's not that many of the regal fritillaries, but um, they do sometimes hang out in gravel areas to, to get minerals, but not, not in huge numbers. I had my first one this year. I, in five years I've been at the refuge, I had my first sighting of a regal fritillary on the Overlook Trail. So if you're at the refuge, keep a lookout. They're pretty amazing. Yeah, and I that's where people have been seeing a lot of them is um, just uh, on the Overlook Trail, the Tallgrass Trail, um, just to re right around the Butterfly Garden even. So they're pretty. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to see them. They're pretty big, right? Yeah, they're about the size of a monarch or maybe a little smaller. Yeah. yeah. Pretty. And I forgot something. I was wondering what I was doing. I couldn't remember. We had so many different projects going on, but we actually filmed for Wild Kingdom last week. Oh. I forgot all about that. <laughs> There's just been so much going on. So uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom contacted us <clears throat> and they wanted to do a segment on the refuge. So they came out and filmed last, what was it, last Tuesday, Karen? Wednesday. Last Wednesday. So. Yeah, it was kind of exciting. So we were planning for that all last week, trying to get all the, we have to get all these special permits. So it took up a lot of my time trying to get that all situated. So they came out for about a half a day and we took them out to the, into the bison enclosure and they got some nice footage of the bison herd and a nice piece of prairie where it was actually a lot of nice native plants, not a lot of invasive species. And then they interviewed Karen, myself, and Scott. And it's going to be just a small snippet on their YouTube channel or on Facebook. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that. So I forgot. That's what kept us busy last week. <laughs> but so it was interesting. Anything else? All right. I think we'll then roll into our special presentation tonight with uh, Kelly Jacobs. And Kelly, if you want to tell a little bit about yourself and then just what your experiences have been at the refuge, how long and share whatever you feel like sharing and, uh, and sure. then roll right into your program, that would be awesome. Sure. So my name is Kelly Jacobs. I, 
met a lot of you. Um, I've been at the refuge since the fall of 2008. I started as an intern and um, this is my third season as a biotech. So I have um, a couple seasons under my belt now. Um, before I came to the refuge, I was in science education. And so um, I suggested this topic for my presentation tonight to Nancy, um, because I really think that everybody can contribute to science. And um, so <coughs> without any further ado, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Is everyone able to see it? Yep. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just talk to you tonight about becoming a community scientist and um, how if you're interested or if you know kids or grandkids or family members or anyone who's interested in science, this is a really good way to practice science um, and help. you can help monitor nature at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge and maybe around the world if you are up for it. Hmm. There we go. Um, so you may have heard it called, it's also known as crowd science, science or citizen science. Um, community science is a really inclusive term for anyone who wants to participate and collaborate in scientific research. Um, it's not a new idea. It's, it may be a new term, but it's, it's an, actually an old idea. And, um, one of the oldest formal citizen science projects um, actually started in the 1900s, the Christmas bird count, which we still do today. Um, that was by the National Audubon Society. So it collects data and informs bird conservation efforts. Um, community scientists require no previous experience. Projects can be done from at home or in the field and can provide a wide variety of benefits. Um, the value of citizen science data is dependent on the quality of data collected. So some projects require observations to be verified by an expert and some do not, depending on whatever the research need, researcher needs. The educational benefits are really invaluable. Community science can be used in a formal educational setting or informally for people of all ages to make discoveries about the world and the environment and taking part in a project can be like starting a new hobby or it can supplement one of your existing hobbies or interests. Community science has the potential to bring society closer to science and nature, um, bringing about a sense of ownership and helping create the kind of society that works to protect its natural environment. Projects can be a really fun way to spend time with friends and family members. I think that's one of the, the biggest benefits of community science, honestly. And of course, uh, community science can serve policymakers by raising awareness about environmental issues and providing evidence for decision making, for example. So at the refuge, we uh, use a number of community science apps. These are also accessible online. Um, so I'm gonna talk about four of them in particular. And um, yeah, if you have any questions about these, just shout because they're my favorite. I really like to contribute to these community science projects. The first one is called Bumblebee Watch. Um, it's a partner project from a variety of agencies across North America. You contribute photos, the location, the date, and the time, and then experts verify your bumblebee identification. So community science co scientists collect this data and it helps researchers determine the status um, and conservation needs of bumblebees helps locate rare or endangered populations of bumblebees um, and teaches us about bees, their ecology and ongoing conservation efforts. So of course I couldn't have a presentation without adding in some of the photos that I've contributed um, to Bumblebee Watch. So I have a couple of American bumblebees. Uh, let's see, uh, this one's on a creamy indigo and there's one on a golden Alexander there. Uh, this one doesn't necessarily have any identification um, clues in it that are that make it obvious, but I just wanted to add it in. Um, we have a two-spotted bumblebee on prairie milkweed, a brown be belted bumblebee on white indigo, and I just thought this one was so fascinating on the purple prairie clover, and you can see the pollen sacs are nice and full. So I love taking pictures of bumblebees, and this is a really great way to 
um, use those photos for good because I'm collecting data and sharing it. The next app that um, we use on the refuge is eBird. And so this is a project of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You contribute a list of birds that you see and you hear while you're out and about, whether that's birding or hiking, and experts review your records. And this really contributes to hundreds of conservation decisions and peer reviewed papers, thousands of student projects and helps inform bird research worldwide. It's quite a significant amount of data. And so um, the community scientists are really helping, um, helping the uh, scientific community with eBird. Um, so the app suggests a list of birds. So I took these screen captures just from my phone. So directly from the app. It's uh, they suggest a list of birds you might see based on your location. So you can see, I just told it to find my location. So that was it. And then it tells me if a bird might be rare there or, um, or if it's common. Um, another thing that you can do is you can um, easily record the number of species you saw, how long you were out birding and how far you walked. Um, and then these records are all kept so that you yourself can go back and look at the birds that you've seen um, at different locations that you're at and just keep a record for yourself too. Uh, it lets you see where others are birding. So this is the general Des Moines area. Um, it tells you what birds others are seeing and if there's any bird um, birding hotspots in your area. And then another thing that I thought was really interesting is you can go to specific locations to see what birds have been recorded and when specific species are typically seen at that location. So eBird is just an incredible, incredible amount of information that you can go to if, if that's something that you're interested in. The next app that we use is called Nature's Notebook, and this is through the USA National Phenology Network. You contribute data throughout the year, so things like information on the leaves, buds, flowers, fruits. Um, if it's an animal, it can be um, if they're reproducing, if they're alive, if they're dead, what they're doing in their life cycle. And then experts use that data to make decisions. So whether that's managers or scientists or researchers, it helps them make decisions on, on what management techniques and when to use them. Um, and the really cool thing about nature's, is no, nature's Notebook is you get to choose what you're monitoring. So it can be anything from the plants in your front yard or the birds that you see when you go on a walk, or it can really be anything. Um, they also have specific campaigns that I think are pretty fun um, that you can contribute to, such as ones called Nectar Connectors, Mayfly Watch, and Pesky Plant Trackers. So you can go onto the um, Nature's Notebook website here, and based on our location in Iowa, it'll tell you what campaigns would be good for you to join. And just a little plug here, this is a volunteer opportunity at the refuge. So um, we have a volunteer that comes every other week, if not every week, to monitor um, different things at the refuge. So we have chosen to monitor mostly plants and animals with a connection to the prairie or the oak savanna, of course. So we look for adult monarchs and caterpillars and eggs. And then we monitor the butterfly milkweed, which is their host plant, of course. And then the prairie violet here. And then in the oak savanna, we monitor um, the leather flower and then bloodroot. Oh, there's our rough blazing star in connection to the to the monarch and other butterflies too as a nectar source. And then um, the red-headed woodpeckers in the oak savanna too. So lots to look at and lots to monitor at the refuge. And finally, the last app that I'm gonna talk about is called iNaturalist. And it's a joint initiative between the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. Um, we have been using this app almost daily uh, this season. We contribute photos, we say where we took that photo and we say when we took it, and then experts can verify your organism identification. So even if you don't know what you're looking at, it's really nice to be able to, someone puts a name on that organism and um, then you're able to know. And the data collected by community scientists contributes to bio, what's something called biodiversity science, which it's really important to know when and where all different types of species occur so that different connections can be made and, and management can be done. Um, specifically for us though, 
it really helps refuge staff because it can update our species list at the refuge. So knowing who lives at Neil Smith really helps us make decisions. Um, iNaturalist is so easy to use. We're especially looking, if you're interested in helping us out at the refuge using iNaturalist, we're especially looking for um, insects like spiders and if you see any fungus. So we, um, we have species lists for those things, but they're kind of short. So we'd like to know if there's anything else out there and having more community scientists out on the refuge will only help our list be more thorough. I just wanted to put some pictures up of things that I have put on iNaturalist myself. Um, before I submitted this praying mantis photo, that was not on our species list. So that's pretty fun. And fungi and other insects that I didn't know what they were called. So iNaturalist told me and now I know. So I learned quite a bit from that app. Um, I just wanted to conclude by um, contributing a couple more places. These were just um, some websites that I went to that um, if you're interested in finding different community science projects, there's a variety of places to go. And really you can find your own, pro like find projects based on what you are interested in and find projects based on location. So um, these are really cool places to go and just look around and see if there's anything you'd like to contribute to. And that is all I have. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. That bumblebee one sounds really cool. Yeah. I like bumblebees. I used to be scared of them, but. I just downloaded. You've come a long way. My husband said he just, PJ said he just downloaded eBird. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. It's really helped me learn a lot of different species. And there's, um, in terms of bees, I think bumblebees are a really fun species to start learning your identification with because they have really cool markings and, and some subtle changes, but a lot of noticeable differences too. So it's a really fun way to learn your bumblebees. We just lost Nancy. She's coming back in right now. Oh, okay. There's a question from Sharon. What were the butterfly and insect on your yeah. last slide? I'm going through my my eye naturalist right now. I know that one of one of them was the um, the black swallowtail. Yeah, that was that dark colored butterfly. And Karen, the insect that was on someone's hand, I think that might be on your iNaturalist. I could be wrong. Sharon, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> When I first saw so, that the insect on your finger, it looked kind of like a carrion beetle. Oh. With the, the, hmm. That markings on the uh, wings. But I'm not sure. That was a long time ago. I'm up to 89 observations on iNaturalist, <laughs> which I'm really proud of. I only started last year in 2020. So, um, yeah, Sharon, I will look through and, and try and get back to you on the name of that insect. Thank yeah, you. I've been thinking about uh, some other refuges actually use iNaturalist where they have it connected to the refuge itself. So I've been thinking about doing that. So you seem like you really get a lot out of use out of that, Kelly. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, it's really helpful that um, experts will come and identify your organism relatively quickly. I, I think I get a faster response on this app than I do on some of the other ones. So it's just nice to know. I, I didn't know what this bug was and a day or two later I do, so. Great, and I my whole screen froze, so I had to, I couldn't uh, do anything, so I had to reboot my whole system, so I missed part of the, I'm sorry that I missed part of the presentation, so oh, if I ask questions that you already talked about, forgive mm -hmm. me, I'm not having okay. a good, an easy role in this today. My technological skills are not showing well tonight, but 
<laughs> anyway, um, the other thing is I didn't give the friends an opportunity to share. So any of the friends members, Mark or Sharon, um, would you like to share anything from the friends side of, of things tonight? Or Amanda? <laughs> Amanda, I'm sorry, I'm looking through the names. Amanda. Um, I would like to share from a membership coordinator standpoint that we had a great uh, meeting about fundraising for our, our friends group. And that was with Courtney, I think it was, from the uh, Wildlife Refuge Association. And she had some really fantastic ideas on how to thank our members and how to keep our members and get new members. Um, so that was really exciting since I'm new into the membership coordinator role. I'm so glad that you're helping out with that, Amanda. And, and PJ has been helping out with the website. So thank you, PJ, for all the help on that. So we couldn't do, we, I, we'd be in hard luck, pressed luck if we didn't have our volunteers and our friends group. I am so, so grateful. We have such a great group of people. So thank you to all of you. Mark, did you want to give an update on the point of sale system or anything yeah, the, else? Uh, right before the pandemic hit, uh, we were seriously considered and now have implemented a, a switch over from the old point of sale system to a new one. This, the software has been ordered and it requires a new PC and monitor, which has been have been ordered. The software is as soon as we get the PC, we get the software on it. We're hoping to have that installed by the 20th. If that happens, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. But I was just <clears throat> at the refuge yesterday and the point of sale system now is, is fully functional, the old one. Uh, the, the only thing that uh, Carla is working on is the phone line, which re is for the credit card machine. So that may be inter interoperable, but uh, so everything else seems to work work pretty well. It's uh, the software program that we're, the point of sale system, the new one <clears throat> is a very simple program. The ones you can get now are all bells and whistles as far as you can order online and get direct shipments and all this kind of stuff. And I said, no, we just need something to run the cash register. That's all. And they were kind of like, well, well that's no fun. Well, it is for us. So we'll, so we'll see what this happens. I'll probably pull the rest of my hair out when we start to try to install all the software, but we'll see. It should, it should go easy. Mark, and did, Joan, did Joan say that we had a, a square that maybe we could use for credit card payments or maybe we could just have people write checks or something? Do, I hadn't <laughs> heard that one. I think we might've had one, yeah. Okay. That so might work, so. And thank you, Mark, for all your hard work on that. Mark um, did a lot of research and investigated several companies. And so, uh, Sharon, do you anything else, Mark, you'd like to share? Nope. Okay, thank you again for all your hard work and hosting the meeting. Sharon, is there anything you'd like to share this evening? So the other thing that's going on is the um, photography contest for the refuge. So there have been some ads in the, uh, the newsletter and some press releases, but anyone that's taking pictures at the refuge, is, refuge can enter those in the photo contest. Uh, the deadline is October 1st. And all entries are submitted um, electronically this year. So if you go to the tallgrass.org website, it has all the details on how to, to enter your outstanding photos from the refuge. The, the newsletter just came out, so everybody should have received the newsletter. And uh, Sharon actually coordinates that and gets the articles going. So thank you, Sharon, for all your work. and with the photography contest and the newsletter. So that's awesome. And I forgot an another thing, it's all coming back to me now that I know what, what I've been working on. The other project that we've been doing is uh, we have a wonderful extern and what it, it, Karen has been working with externs for the last couple of, uh, several years. I don't know how many years now, but they're basically teachers through the STEM council, Iowa STEM council. council. They work at different, uh, different organizations to get background in science. So Karen has been working with uh, in, uh, externs every year. And so we actually got an extern this year for six weeks. And it's a teacher from an Altoona elementary school. And she's been working with us, how to, reviewing our curriculum, our teacher workshop, just giving our, uh, us insight on how to manage and better do our classes and just a really, really valuable experience. So uh, she's gonna be winding up the six weeks next week and Patrick's been coordinating her projects and doing an awesome job. So really valuable and I'd like to continue doing that and having an extern each summer if I can, just to keep building on our program. 
at this point with our environmental education, we're reviewing how we do it. And, and that's what it was made to do. It's even written into the, the mission statement for environmental education at the refuges to review it and make it better. So that's what we're in the process of doing. So thankful to have the extern Erin Sears with us. Anybody else uh, open the floor to anybody else that wants to share anything that's fun and exciting or just want to share any kind of news? Anybody uh, doing any? Nancy, are, are you, is there any plan to get an intern for visitor services this year at all then or not? Maybe not for not for this season. The reason we, we went against it is because so much is done with outreach and public contact and being in the building that mm -hmm. we Forgone, we didn't forego having having a inter, any interns because of that. With Karen's interns, they can actually go out in the field. The mm -hmm. other really difficult limiting factor, we were only allowed 25% capacity of staff in. That means four, only four staff members in the building at one time. So the more staff we have, the more we have to kind of juggle schedules. So it became really difficult. So that's why we didn't get a seasonal ranger this year or um, or any interns because of that. So maybe if things, we'll see how the fall looks or even then, I we just have to kind of mm -hmm. see what happens and work with it. It would be trying to recruit somebody quickly and get them on board. So it may not be until next spring that we get somebody for, for visitor yeah. services. It's a good question, so. Well, I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Thanks again for your patience with the, the link issue. Kelly, awesome job with the presentation. Kelly has been just an integral part of our staff for a number of years now doing just so many things with the, and she does a great job with coordinating the intern work. So a lot of good stuff going on. Thank you, Kelly, for all your hard work. So awesome group of people. We're lucky to have you all. We're lucky to have our friends group. Anybody else, anything else? It's about one minute till 7.30. Um, we can hang. I, there, I have no place to go. I'm here with my cats and my family just hanging. So anything you want to share or comment, or if you have to cut out, that's all good too. Kelly, I use iNaturalist and I love it because it brings suggestions up immediately. And then I can be, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. But then I've had it where I put in something, I just put in a like worm or something, and then someone will come and correct it and say insect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so helpful. I really like, you can go online and if you zoom into Neil Smith, you can see everywhere people have been and, and the different organisms that they're documenting. There's a lot around the trails and things, but there's, you know, there's some scattered all over the refuge. It's really cool to see. Yeah. I used to looking for uh, people that volunteers to help with the phenology nature's notebook project. Yeah. Karen. I think we're always looking for it. So yes. if that's something what's the time. I don't know if you went over this apologies if it, if you did, but what's the time commitment on that? So we do it once a week, but it's not expected that someone is there once a week, every week. Um, but to do, so to do, we do it on the Overlook Trail and the Oak Savannah Trail. And that takes about, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half total, especially in the summertime. In the winter, it's a little bit shorter because there's fewer things to monitor. But um, yeah, so it's really just on a, you know, of course, a volunteer basis whenever they can come out. And we would teach them how to do it. We'd go out with them and, and teach them how to do it, so. If you have any questions, if, uh, you can contact me or if you don't have Karen's email address and, or contact Karen directly on that if you're interested. It's really fun and mm -hmm. there's specific, are you just doing plants at this point or are you doing animals too? The only wild, we have wildlife, the monarch and the redheaded woodpecker. Okay. So you go out and you look for specific, so you don't have to know 20 or 50 different plants and animals. There's very specific things you're looking for, species you're looking for. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it's pretty. Individual plants. So we have the plants marked. Um, so you go to that specific plant 
uh, it's not just a species that you're looking for. So, yeah. All right, any other questions? Any? Right. Maybe a question for Kelly. Um, sure. With that iNaturalist, um, does it automatically geo-reference um, the site where you see the thing? Like, does it, or, or do you tell it that you're at Neil Smith or, or how, does, you, like if you take a picture with your phone or your iPad, does it know where you're at or do you have to tell it? I've only, um, I've only used it where you have to tell it where you took the photo. One nice thing about it is that if you haven't submitted to iNaturalist in a while and you go through the photos on your phone or your iPad, it'll, you don't have to go back and say when you took it, it'll automatically take that from your photos app. But yeah, you just, um, you just use a map and get your, your general location. Okay. When, when I do it, I just, it, it gets the location from my phone. From my phone. Oh, okay. So yeah, I am really, I'm used to like going back at the end of the day and submitting all my iNaturalist photos that I took that day. So that's why I have to go back and tell it where I took each photo. But if you see something, take a photo and want to submit it to iNaturalist right away, you can just use, just push the button that says current location. Okay. That assumes you've got your GPS tracking on your phone. Right. Yeah. In service. <laughs> <laughs> And that. <laughs> I think too, um, I've been using iNaturalist a bit. And um, if you have your like location set on your photos, if that makes sense, like if your photos track the location, then it will automatically upload. Cause I've even gone back and uploaded pictures um, like even weeks or months later and it still has the date and location. <clears throat> like tracked with the photo. So um, I think that's an Apple thing. So ask, I think, uh -huh. um, but you have to have that setting kind of turned on. So that's another way you can do it. That's on Android too. So okay. I want that, that would make it easier. Yeah. Can that be the next uh, tutorial is how to set that up on our phones? <laughs> that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing what's out there. The new, uh, the extern I was just speaking about, she has in some kind of app, you just put it up to the plant that you're yeah. looking at and it IDs it. And I mean, there's, it gets it down to the species pretty well. I was pretty impressed. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, I've heard of that app. But yeah, pretty cool stuff. All right, any, any last questions or comments? Well, once again, thank you all for joining. I really appreciate uh, the support. You'll be getting an email from me about, I'll be sending out a general email just to all the volunteers. And then, oh, uh, Angel, Angela and Virginia just said the plant app is called Picture This. Uh -huh. They just put it in the chat. Thank you. So I'll be sending out a general email to all of the volunteers, just telling them about the updates with the, the hours in the visitor center. And then I will be reaching out to the nature store volunteers to see if you're interested in volunteering again at the desk. So we'll see how it all works out. But uh, those volunteers that if they do want to come back, we will definitely have a training and make sure that we're taking good care of you and answering all your questions, making sure we're doing all the right things as best as we can. So, so until we meet again, we do have a, a, Another program scheduled for August. It's this, I think it's the 13th of August. It'll be the afternoon session, hopefully with an invitation with the right link. We can only hope. So hopefully you'll join us. And I think we're gonna go over uh, prairie plants. So it's just such a pretty time. And we have so many beautiful pictures and uh, just sharing some background information about some of the prairie plants. So I think that would be fun. So a great time to be out at the refuge. So if you can take a walk on the Overlook Trail, lots of beautiful flowers around the butterfly garden and then maybe some regal fritillaries around too. So hopefully, and then the bison calves. So lots of good stuff to see. So I hope to see you out there soon. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can contact me and we'll try to get you the right answers. And thank you again for all your support. And we'll see you soon.
Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take Thanks. care. Be well.